Welcome to the All About Alts podcast, where we explore the world of alternative investing to help you find financial independence. Join our host, Newview Trust's president, Jason DeBono, as he covers a variety of topics with different guest speakers to discuss tax and alternative investing strategies. It is never too late to start taking control of your financial future, and we are so excited for you to be joining us for this opportunity to hear from some of the best in the business. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the All About Alts podcast. I am your host, Jason DeBono, and I am joined with a fellow Jason here, Jason Engelman from Freaky Fast Home Buyers and Investments, uh, also Freaky Fast Capital. Um, Jason, good to have you on the show, man. Hey, great to be on the show. And Jason's such a great name, isn't it? You know, it, we uh, we select our podcast guests based on name alone. And then uh, I think you'll find today uh, this Jason uh, not only earns the opportunity with his name, but his credentials uh, supersede uh, where he's at name wise. So we're going to kind of dig in. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. And, uh, you know, I always love kind of doing some Internet sleuthing. And, um, you know, some of our podcasts I know directly, some I know indirectly, uh, you know, through relationships they have with our company. And uh, this was one I got to dig a little bit on. And, oh, man, this was fun. Um, so we're we're going to. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of Jason, the, the person, who you are. You've got a, a quite a background. Um, so let me just highlight a couple things and then we'll start unpacking uh, some of those bit by bit. Um, executive management background uh, turned real estate investor, which, you know, is a really cool story. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, manages over $30 million of investments. So, you know, clearly today's not his first day in the real estate business. And uh, that's something that uh, that's that's critical uh, to understand is that journey that people have been through. Um, uh, when he's not managing thirty million bucks, he also finds time to uh, to be the pastor at Triumph Baptist Church in Fort in uh, Fort Worth, where he lives. And then, if that's not enough, uh, he went ahead and married uh, a country music artist, uh, Tori Martin, just to ensure uh, that he could have something else on his plate. So, uh, Jason, I, I I know there was more I probably could list, but let's just pause there. How do you find time to eat breakfast? I don't. That's the thing. I don't eat breakfast. You know, I roll out of bed and I just literally put on my slippers and walk into work. Uh, but no, it, it's it's fun. It's challenging. Uh, I try to take trips and uh, and and down and get some downtime. But uh, but yeah, I, I have a hard time sitting still. And that's been the case since kindergarten. So I guess it just kept up with me. Well, I, I love that. And, and the secret to success, here's everyone saying you got to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. And, and I think, Jason, you just cracked that myth, you know, <laughs> which is it's not that important. You just roll out of bed and get straight to work. So let's talk about work. Um, you know, so you're, you're working in corporate America, executive management, you know, having a great career. What, what and when, you know, kind of started this journey where you said, hey, wait a minute, you know, maybe there's a way for me to not be in this kind of corporate America uh, environment and and be in the real estate space. How that how that that journey for you start? Gosh, that's a great question. And if I may, and this may be part of being a pastor, right? I'm gonna kind of like go off this huge rabbit trail, but it, just to kind of give you a little backstory, uh, I've always been an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and I started at such a young age, my mom and dad, uh, they helped me start a donut business when I was five years old. And, uh, so I've always been in sales. Uh, like we would go, uh, my mom made like some deal with some, uh, donut shop. We'd buy a dozen, uh, donuts for two bucks. And then I would take them out to car mechanics and, uh, car washes and any place that's open Saturday morning to sell them for $4. And uh, so just always had that entrepreneurial spirit that was kind of taught to me at a young age. And then I've always been in sales. So even in like uh, in a corporate uh, setting, I was always kind of um, uh, just always pitching, always selling, always uh, creating new business. And, and so that that's always just kind of been in me. Um, the, in 2014, I moved into the oil and gas sector. And uh, did a lot of investments in, in managing uh, 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 new exploration and, and so forth. And then in 2016, the oil market crashed. Um, Saudi Arabia refused to decrease their production. And you saw oil go from like 115 all the way down to, I think it was like 27 at one point. 
And, and I just, I was tired of dealing with, with all just the stress that comes with that and married my wife and we moved to Nashville for her music. And I was just kind of looking for something to do. And I opened up a Craigslist ad, believe it or not, when people still use Craigslist and there was a real estate investment opportunity job, um, uh, listing and I applied and I pestered and pestered and called and called and emailed and and finally they responded interviewed me and and gave me a shot so that was kind of the transition into into real estate so a a little bit of a rabbit trail but hopefully it gives you a little bit of a background no but i i I love uh you know i love hearing a lot of these stories because i think we all you know generally at a pretty young age people start to to develop a career path and it seems silly and and uh you know for those that are listening you know that have kids you know you're kind of looking at your kids and you know, we joke, oh, that, gosh, you know, that child's going to do X or Y, or man, they've got the brain of an engineer, you know, always selling something. I, I think we do start to see that. And while it may not always materialize, I think when it does, uh, it really creates just a really cool story um, of longevity. And, and it sounds like you're right where you kind of were destined to be from a long, long time ago. And I, I love the markup on the donuts. I've, I've, uh, I've got a couple kids and I'm, I'm starting to to think through maybe they need to be in the donut business. Uh, they're always looking to hustle something. So um, so let, let's let's kind of fast forward now. And, and uh, you know, in that story from donuts, uh, donut sales entrepreneur to, you know, you got a job now on the investment side. So you're working, you're being paid in, in some capacity to be in real estate investment. How did that kind of transpire from and develop into you know, buying real estate and then helping others buy real estate and then managing investment funds in which, you know, you have investors in, you know, that build this kind of 30 plus million dollar portfolio. Sure. So I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I had some experience in oil and gas invested investments. And when we went into uh, Nashville and I got into the real estate game, it was a wholesaling company. So at the time, I knew really nothing about real estate other than fixing and flipping, you know, because of HDTV, just like everybody else, right? And and so I had like an understanding, but not really a understanding. Like I knew it was there, but didn't really know exactly all the ins and outs and uh, on all the different strategies. So this group was out of California. Nashville at the time was, and still is, fairly hot market. And at the time, it was one of the hottest in the, in the country. And so they were sending out leads and postcards and mailers and all the good stuff. And they needed an acquisitions manager. So they brought me in and really just taught me everything from evaluating deals and, and comping deals to figure out, you know, what the ARVs are and, and how to build out rehab budgets and so forth. And, and then eventually they moved out of Nashville. They went to a different state. And, um, and so then I started my own wholesaling business and it was very, very tough in Nashville because there was just so much competition and the prices were just skyrocketing. I didn't have a real big budget in my pocket, you know, and when I tell the story, people usually laugh and they're like, okay, whatever. But we literally had $20 and uh, my wife likes to brag that she was my first investor because it was her $20, but we wrote out handwritten letters. And it said, hey, we buy houses with cash. And we were standing in the uh, post office. Uh, I think we have 40 letters because we had enough to get, or uh, yeah, we had $20. So whatever that is, like 40 stamps, I think, uh, we were able to send out uh, those letters. And I prayed over, I was like, God, I got bills and I really need a deal. And we mailed them off. And two days later, I got a call uh, from a guy. And uh, it was a house in East Nashville, which is a real popular place. And and the fact that he called me, I, I mean, it, it, to me, it was really just a God thing. And so then I uh, brought in a, a contractor. We walked it, got some numbers. I also brought in a, a guy who I knew fix and flips home, flipped homes. And so that was my first deal. And we made a $10,000 wholesale fee on that. And uh, so I was super stoked. And so we did about 20 deals. But I didn't have a whole lot of marketing budget. Um, and there was a lot of competition in Nashville. And so it was really feast or famine. I'm not going to lie. There was months where it was a real, real struggle and it was very discouraging and and you're constantly grinding. And, um, again, I think a lot of it for me, obviously it's God and it's, it's, um, his, his guidance in my life, but he opened a door in Columbus, Georgia for me. Uh, I had a gentleman call me who I bought a house from. And uh, he said, hey, my mom's turning 80 
and she's got uh, 20, uh, 20 homes in Columbus, Georgia that she's wanting to sell. Are you interested? And I was like, absolutely. Knew nothing about Columbus, Georgia. I, now, I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Huge Buckeye fan, OH. Uh, didn't know there was a Columbus, Georgia. Uh, so we went there and, and, and just really fell in love with the small town. And, and so we uh, wholesaled and kind of partnered on those deals. And that was my first real acquisition because I actually uh, was a partner in purchasing those and uh, did that for a couple months with those uh, investors and then started Freaky Fast uh, on the side and, and just blew that up. And uh, it was just kind of, a, like I said, a God thing. A lot of hard work and a lot of answered prayers and a lot of lost tears, as you can see. So that's yeah, kind I of can, a quick elevator pitch. <laughs> I can imagine the, uh, you know, I think so many people in real estate, they, you know, and, and I love that that you referenced HGTV. And, you know, it, it, it is great that they've helped open up a lot of people's eyes to real estate as an investment and an opportunity, because I think the younger generation uh, is all starting to kind of see real estate as, hey, this is this is kind of more normal, whereas 10, even 20 years ago, um, it wasn't that it wasn't normal. It just was a very exclusive asset class. And I think that's great. Now, it's, you know, create some new challenges, but uh, sometimes that that just exposure, you know, and, and HGTV certainly has that reach. Um, it gets more people involved. And I think it's a wonderful thing in, in the grand scheme of it all. Now, you brought up Columbus, Georgia. Um, I, I did have a note here on Columbus, Ohio. I didn't tell you this in the preamble, but I was born and raised uh, in uh, a Michigan Wolverines fan. So oh, wow. um, this is one of the few times that that we can take full advantage of saying this. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it, it feels good. Um, but I guess we we got we got our championship and lost our coach. So um, you know maybe some ups and downs at the same time. But yeah, it's been go. a fun rivalry and and ironic that that as a Columbus, Ohio guy. Your, your first major acquisition is in Columbus, Georgia, which, uh, you know, when we get off of this uh, podcast, I'll probably Google uh, as I love learning about towns that I've never heard of before. So um, good, to, uh, good to know and, and was saving that for the end, but figured I'd trot that out yeah, uh, here partway through. Let's talk a little bit about your wife and, and certainly yeah. don't want to make this about her, but I, I want to talk about it as it relates to how you manage that. I think a lot of people, when you're an entrepreneur, it's hard to be an entrepreneur in a marriage, no matter what. Um, because that's a the, the needs and wants and requirements uh, of sometimes of a business can get in the way in the needs and wants and requirements of a marriage. And so um, you have an added element, which is, you know, you have a, a spouse that, you know, helps and, and uh, works in the business to some degree, but also has not just her own career, but a career that requires a, a lot of travel and a lot of, uh, you know, probably different events and things that may not line up perfectly. So how do you manage that and and what advice and guidance do you have for our listeners that may have similar situations, maybe not uh, to the same degree, but, uh, you know, where they've got this entrepreneurial uh, home and maybe people running in a few different directions while still trying to run in the same direction? Don't do it. <laughs> no, I honestly, I wish there was a... Um, I wish there was like this bulletproof plan. And I, you know, one thing that I always say to people in the church is that I, I want to be as candid and as real as possible. I think people hunger for that authenticity. They, they hear these podcast interviews or they see something on TV and it's like, Oh, I want that. And, and really don't see everything behind the scenes. Um, he, first of all, I'm very blessed. My wife um, is way out of my league. I, uh, I always say I, I shot for the moon and, and I actually hit it. I didn't hit a star. I actually hit the moon. And, and so I'm very blessed in that sense. The other thing I'm very blessed in is the fact that she also has an entrepreneurial spirit to, to some degree. Um, and I think by being with me, I've helped get her into that, uh, help her fine tune that even a little bit more. Um, you know, in the music industry, it's a, it's a very challenging in industry. And she's been doing it since 16. She started singing in the church choir and and just has an incredible voice. And someone uh, who was in the church uh, was also in country music and and just really started help fine tuning her. And so she uh, ended up dropping out of uh, school and, and homeschooled the last uh, two years of of her high school career. And she was doing a lot of music lessons, piano lessons, guitar lessons, vocal lessons. I mean, she really went all in, almost kind of like an athlete would. And she's been doing it ever since. 
and she's she's worked very very hard i'm really proud of her and for any of you that might be curious her name is tori martin uh definitely look her up on itunes and apple music spotify she's got a song right now stepping in it on the radio that's doing really well and uh, so i'm super super proud of her but to kind of dive a little deeper into i guess your question about how do we manage it, it it's tough um you know <laughs> I one of the things I liked about real estate is it did cr create uh, more freedom than like working from nine to five. The problem with me is I um, I'm constantly building and it, it's just part of my nature. I, I just I want to build bigger and bigger. And it, it turned out I built a, a, almost a nine to five type company, but maybe even more than that being the, the CEO. So that's been a challenge. Um, but. You know, Tori's been with me every step of the way in in the real estate, and sh and she, I mean, from the very beginning, I just, like she likes to brag, she was my first investor. Um, but you know, I think communication is the most important thing in anything. Um, it's tough to do sometimes. You have to have some hard conversations, it, whether it's with your spouse or maybe with employees or whether it's with investors. It, it's not necessarily fun. Um, but conversation is, is very important and just, you know, being open and, and saying, Hey, you know, I've noticed over the last couple of months, maybe you've not focused on me enough, or, um, you know, maybe we haven't spent as much time together. So there, there's times where you just have to have that open conversation and to be fluid and to work and support. And, and I'm very blessed that, that, uh, Tori supports me and, and we support, uh, uh her and her career and, and uh, so, um, so yeah, sometimes we ask ourselves, why do we take on this much? Um, and sometimes we're really, really exhausted, but, but we try to make life fun. Um, and we, it's funny, we have a, a reality TV show that we've, we started filming uh, when we first moved to Nashville, when we first started the real estate business and her music um, career in Nashville. It's called Living the Dream. And uh, we got one season uh, filmed. It's on Pure Flix if you want to find that. Or uh, it's Pure Flix and then Amazon, I think you can get it. And uh, I think going back and watching the very beginning of those episodes, or, or not even uh, the episodes, but like the trailers that we had put together, we were so young and we were so ambitious. And But we kept saying, we just want to live our dream. And I think that's that's the ultimate thing is know why you're doing what you're doing. Have fun doing it. You're going to make mistakes. There's going to be hard conversations to have, but just enjoy life as much as you possibly can. So I, I think that would be my my tidbit of advice. Well, I love it. And and I appreciate, uh, you know, you kind of giving us that that holistic picture. You know, I think just some takeaways and highlights that I heard out of that. I mean, certainly, you know, in every relationship, right, communication is key. But, you know, when you've got two young, ambitious people that are in some ways running in the exact same direction and then at other times maybe running in opposite directions, not purposely, but just chasing dreams, um, you know, it is hard and it is it's not going to be easy. And, and that road to success is not just a paved road. Sometimes uh, you're not even sure what road you're on or if you're even on the right one. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, as you can learn from from Jason and Tori's story is you've got to kind of look and say, where do I want to get to? Um, and, and what is that, um, you know, journey look like? I, I love what you said about, you know, the nine to five. And, and so many people think that if I just get into real estate, I can work less. And, you know, what I think people don't realize about, realize about being successful in real estate or any other career in country music, um, it, it's a different type of nine to five. And, you know, your passion is fueling you. But I, I think anyone that's an entrepreneur or anyone that, that manages or operates their, you know, any sort of entrepreneurial business will tell you they work more hours being self-employed than they ever did when they were, uh, you know, gainfully employed in some form of company. But what you have is freedom and freedom isn't necessarily less work. Freedom is maybe financial freedom, time freedom. And so if you need to do something at two o'clock, you have the luxury to do it. Uh, and maybe at midnight, you're sitting on your computer trying to figure out the next proposal. So, um, you know, your your story and your journey is such a cool one. And, and I appreciate you kind of walking us through that. Um, we're going to, you know, transition away from kind of who is Jason and his his personal life and and how did he his foray into kind of uh, the real estate world. And uh, let's transition. Uh, we're going to pause for our quirky questions of the day. Always, always one of my favorite parts of the show. But I want to talk and really dig into the real estate side right? What markets are you serving? How 
do you do what you do? And what is a day in the life of, of a real estate entrepreneur, uh, especially when it comes to being a steward of other investors' funds? And so uh, we'll get right to that. But uh, Amy has our quirky questions of the day. Grabbing the middle envelope here. Uh, if you have quirky questions, please continue to submit those. Uh, for season two, we've got a new updated email. Uh, it is all about alts at newviewtrust.com. That's all about alts at newview with a U, trust.com. Uh, but get those sent in. I always enjoy this part. Jason, are you ready? You're going to be I'm on ready. the hot seat. Here we go. All right. Simple out of the gate. All right. Sweet right. or savory? Ooh. <laughs> um, man, I'm, I'm kind of a both kind of guy, you know, I, I like my chicken and waffles, you know, you got a little bit of that savory and that sweet. So, uh, I like both. I know that's uh, probably <laughs> taking a, a neutral kind of side answer, but, uh, but yeah, I like both. Hey, these are your questions to answer. And, and I love, uh, the Nashville and Texas uh, has sort of overtaken those maybe northern routes where you're referencing chicken and waffles. Uh, yeah. I love that. So, uh, all right, number two, if you could learn or speak any language, what would it be? French. All right, you got to you got to give us a little why behind that. Uh, okay, so it's funny. <laughs> um, when I went to a school, I uh, in our Christian school, uh, they were doing French, and I remember being like, I don't want to. French and and fortunately for me, uh, they were on year two, and so even though they're my grade, it was a new school, so I, I didn't take it. But then I met my wife; uh, her family's French Cajun. Um, they uh, so like her grandpa and grandma they speak French. We went to Paris, and man, I absolutely fell in love with France, the food, the people, the atmosphere, and uh, yeah. So French is a is a language that I would absolutely love to have learned. And uh, the problem is I have a hard time rolling my tongue. And uh, so rolling the R's and the stuff, whether it's French or Spanish, even though it's a little bit different, I, I just, I struggle with it. You know, I'm as plain Jane as <laughs> when it comes to uh, accents and voices as you can get. So I struggle with that. Well, French it is. And, and uh, it's always important to know what the in-laws are saying. If yeah. They're speaking a different language. So that's it. Uh, all right. Number three. What's the most memorable piece of advice you've ever gotten? And it may not be good or bad advice. Let me just preface that. But the most memorable bit of advice you got. Hmm. Um, there's a few that pop into my mind. Um, two, when I was a little boy, one of the things that my mom and dad said, uh, every time you disobey, something bad happens. Um, and if you kind of look in life, if, you know, throughout your life, when maybe you did something wrong, it, it affected somebody. Um, I remember a little bit later, my grandpa saying, do right, do right. It always pays to do right. Um, so those are two basic, real simple ones. Um, and then my grandpa told me this oh, when I was in college and I was trying to date this girl and, uh, trying is the, the key word. And uh, he said, you know, find someone who's as passionate about you as you are them. And uh, and so that really stuck out to me. And I think you can probably apply that to any any relationship or or anything in life. You know, find something that you can be passionate about, but it, it gives it back in return. So um, not necessarily a business uh, advice, but just practical good advice for life. I love it. And, you know, I think sometimes if, if you've got good practical personal advice and guidance, it always seems to translate well into business, right? Um, yeah. I think if you you look and you start, you know, slicing the the world into two, like personals over here and professionals over here, the reality is it's not. Um, they all blend together. And I think you'll find that a lot of the things that you do right on the personal side are the same principles in business. And when you get it wrong, and we all do inevitably, you know, the stuff that we get wrong in our personal life, a lot of times, if we do the same thing in our business life, we're going to get that wrong too. So um, good, uh, overall good advice and, and appreciate you sharing that. So you are off the uh, the hot seat. Thanks again for for those of you listening that are continuing to uh, to submit your quirky questions. Uh, always fun reading those. And and I, I never look at them because I want the uh, little bit of suspense as I open the envelope too. Uh, but uh, always fun. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's talk about real estate. So, um, you know, you're, you're, Let's start with, you've got over $30 million of real estate that you manage. Let's start with, 
asset class, um, you know, our class is kind of what's that look like? And then geographics, uh, you know, markets that you're in or, or assets that you're in. Um, talk to us about both of those. Sure. So primarily single family homes. Um, you know, there's a couple smaller like complex. Uh, we have like a 11 uh, unit apartment complex, uh, duplexes, triplexes, a couple quadplexes, but primarily single family homes. Um, and it's harder to scale that that industry um, in in a lot of ways. Hence, why a lot of people really promote uh, multifamily or you know like mobile home parks or something like that. If you're really trying to scale, but but single family homes uh, is a great uh, sector to be in uh, right now. Um, we're seeing the largest migration in the history of the United States and the millennial generation moving into the single family sector. So it's a great spot to be in. Um, so. There's that. And then the second is uh, we're in Columbus, Georgia. That was the first market we went into. Then we went into Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I have a lot of family in Cincinnati. I've always loved that market. Ohio is just a great state to invest in. Um, there's just a lot of opportunity. is a lot of affordability. Indiana is another state that we're in. Uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas. Um, and we're identifying a couple markets right now in uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, Arkansas. Awesome. So, you know, I think it's one of the, the really cool things and about real estate. You can own real estate anywhere. And yeah. I think there's something to be said if, if you're, you know, getting into it, you know, stick close to home and make sure that, that you're not creating this environment. But, you know, I think your story is testimony to here's a market that where the opportunity was far better than the geographics, right? You know, Columbus, Georgia was not on your radar. You weren't planning to live there and manage the properties. So, you know, it really doesn't matter. Um, but what does matter is that you are deliberate through the purchase process and kind of stay in your lane. And it sounds like your lane really is the, the single family with, you know, type anything really that's not considered that commercial multifamily. So some of the smaller, um, you know, uh, duplexes, quads and that sort of thing. So, um, what, what does that look like from a management standpoint, right? You know, you, you, you find a property, Cincinnati, Kentucky, wherever it may be, um, and you're acquiring that is the goal to buy them and hold them and rent them. Are you buying and renovating and renting? Are you buying and renovating and flipping? Are you wholesaling, you know, and, and is it, it is it a mix of all of that? How do you approach these acquisitions and kind of what is that strategy behind purchase? Yeah, great question. Um, we pretty much do all those strategies. We don't really wholesale very much, um, but we are uh, uh, doing all the other uh, different avenues. We we built out a calculator that we just punch in numbers and it pretty much tells us how we should dispo that house. So sometimes we'll say, hey, this is a house that you need to keep as a rental, or this is a house that maybe you sell as a rental, or maybe this is a house that you sell as a flip. And so it, it it or you know maybe it's all three so then you just kind of look at maybe what uh what lane or what uh, dispo is needing more properties at that time and then you just move them all in that direction but uh but yeah so though that's really kind of how we identify um and how we manage truthfully i think that's an evolving um operation you know you're constantly trying to get better and as you grow you start seeing pressure points in different spots and so then you have to evaluate okay what are we doing that's not working that we need to fix how do we fix that and so that's something that you know we've really tried to get better at as we continue to scale so we've got an executive team that we have meetings where we sit down and we really go through it um, to make sure that we are leading our our other teams and other departments as effectively and efficiently as possible. And uh, so that that can be a challenge. But we have a corporate team outside of that uh, works inside of our office in Fort Worth. And then we have our uh, other teams in each market that are our boots on the ground. Well, you know, I, I think I, I think everyone that listens to this show knows I love real estate and, and just think it's such an amazing asset class. Um, you know, I think we're on our 30 something episode and uh, I don't know that we've ever had a whole lot of overlap. You know, it may appear like there's overlap, but there's just so many strategies. And I, I kind of love, you know, something that you said, and I, I think it's worth maybe just just putting a bow on. And that is, you know, you've developed kind of a, a calculator, right? That's your little bit of secret sauce 
um, and, and IP that you have and manage for your business. And as a result, it allows you to look at real estate through lots of different lenses. And I think if there's a takeaway for anyone listening today, you know, that's such a key way to evaluate real estate. Uh, it's not a one size fits all and you can't be in every asset class in every market under every strategy, right? There's a point, but you can find good quality properties. And sometimes the best way to, to make money on that asset may not be to buy it and rent it or buy it and flip it and buy it. You can look at those and, and, and let that um, you know, make the most sense financially. And, and sometimes financially is also not the most money. Um, you know, sometimes the terms in which you can buy it may make it better to hold longer term, even though you may make a little more money to flip it, but you may not get the cash flow if you were to flip it. So all of that uh, to say, you know, it's great to hear, you know, that strategy being a little bit multifaceted, but but not having to to know everything about everything, which kind of leads me into, you know, your you guys help investors in a lot of different ways. And, and that's kind of takes maybe that same strategy, which is it's a one to many you know, type dimension. And so, you know, I, I know you guys kind of have a, a private lending pool, right? Where people can be a lender to you. Um, and, and you have properties that you, you know, buy, fix, rent, and then sell as turnkey. So, you know, investors can get right into the asset and own it. Uh, and they can own it on the real estate side or, or be a lender on the debt side. Uh, and then you've got, you know, partnerships or, or investment funds that you put together that allow people you know, to really participate in a series of investments, almost like a mutual fund, right? Where, you know, this is something that we talk a lot about on this show and, you know, funds are fantastic, but funds are like mutual funds, right? You got to number one, understand the operator of the fund. If, if they're not doing what they say they're doing or doing it well, it's not a good investment, right? Even if the assets look good. So, you know, my advice to everyone on the fund side is make sure you're understanding what the fund, forget about the returns that are being generated or promised, who's managing it that, you know, the fund and making those decisions. Cause even in a mutual fund, somebody still got to be the one that's buying the stocks. They've got to make decisions to buy, to sell, when's the right time. And they got to be out in front of markets. And that's no different in a fund in real estate. And then the second side is what's the strategy of the fund? You know, there's, there's lots of opportunities out there. And so um, talk to us a little bit about those kind of three different, you know, points and, and how did you kind of get to that um, whereby you're giving investors really a, a, a few different ways to participate in the investment market alongside you or with you. Um, so yeah, give us a little bit of color on that if you can. Sure. Let me ask you one question and to kind of set up the answer. How often or how many times have you heard investing in real, why to invest in real estate is to create passive income? Oh man, if I had a dollar every time I heard that, uh, I don't know that I'd need to be, uh, you know, host <laughs> this podcast. And, and, you know, that's kind of what is preached and that's what's taught. And then people get into real estate and investing and they realize it's not passive. I mean, it is a lot of work, uh, whether you're trying to identify the properties, whether you're trying to manage the crews to rehab it. Even if you're working another job, a lot of times you create a second job. And the, the whole idea between, between uh, um, the whole idea about our company is to create passive investments. And, and the way we do that is by taking on all the brunt work, you know, identifying the properties, scheduling the crews, building out the scopes of work, ordering the materials. Um, once the properties are done, doing all the inspections and, and renting out the properties, managing those tenants. We want we wanted to create opportunities for you to put your money to work and it work for you. And, and that way it is strictly passive. Um, the only, only time I really recommend somebody getting fully into real estate um, is if they're wanting to get out of the job that they're doing and they want to they want to create uh, that f uh, freedom that you talked about, whether it was time freedom, whatever. And it's like, OK, get into real estate. It's going to be active. It's, you're going to spend a lot of work and, and time in it. But but it, it is a way to get you out of that you know, corporate setting. But if you've got a great job, you know, a lot of our investors, they invest with qualified funds out of their uh, IRAs, or maybe they invest um, just with uh, passive income that they've set aside for investing out of their financial portfolio. And, you know, they're doctors and dentists and attorneys and, you know, uh, tech developers, and they just literally want their money to go to work for them. Uh, we we try to structure an opportunity to do that. And so you can do it either a through private lending, like you said, 
um, where you're just lending the capital to us to buy properties, flip them, rehab them. And once we dispo that house, that loan gets paid off. Um, again, very, very strictly passive, uh, but a, a great way to invest. Or you could buy the property, own it outright, and we manage it for you. And it's full turnkey. It's cash flowing. Um, the third is our funds, kind of like what you mentioned. And I really like the funds more because it does diversify your investment into multiple properties. Um, and it allows you to maybe not, I mean, it's always risky. Any investment's risky. If people tell you investments aren't risky, they're lying to you. Now there's elements of that risk. Uh, there's some that are riskier than others. Um, but, but, uh, there's always a risk involved, but what's nice about the equity fund is you have the ability to kind of skill and grow your investment a little bit quicker than maybe investing just directly into into a home and the reason we create all three is because for some investors they prefer one of those three um and and then there's some who want to do all three and and so it's just kind of uniquely tailor fitted uh for your needs and and, and your preference i guess is the right word well, you know, funds represent, um, you know, I think the greatest opportunity, but also uh, they're not easy, right? You know, the for a lot of passive investors that, that truly want to be passive, the funds, you know, it is like buying a stock or bond or mutual fund, right? You're getting diversity and all of those things. And uh, but selecting a fund, evaluating it, understanding the strategy, understanding the operators, um, that takes time. Right. It, it takes time for people to understand who they are and what they do and how they do it and, and really the why behind it. Um, but to get true exposure to real estate without having to roll up your sleeves and really be in it, um, you know, it's hard for for one off investors uh, to buy one property. Right. You sink or swim based on the performance of that property. And, you know, if we we kind of look at market conditions and we'll kind of wrap wrap this segment up, you know, on that, like every market is different. And, you know, we're here we are in, in early 2024. Uh, it's an election year. There's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that. Uh, we've just gotten on the backside, it appears, of kind of this interest rate um, skyrocket that, that we've been riding, which is, has impacted different asset classes and areas uh, geographically of the market differently. So, you know, there is no one size fits all approach. And sometimes there are winners and losers, just like in the market, uh, even if the S&P is up 18% for the year, uh, you can still find lots of, of stocks in the S&P that lost money, right? And so if you only bought one and, and you were one of the losers, you missed, right, the value of the overall 18% of the market. Uh, if you bought into the S&P and bought a little bit of everything, then, yeah, you don't really care that A and B were down because, you know, DCF and, and uh, the rest of the alphabet were all up. And as a result, you have a positive portfolio. So, you know, something that, that's always worth considering for people, you know, not suggesting that you can only invest into a fund and it's the only thing you should do. But uh, I think it's important for people to really evaluate and understand what that fund is. Do your due diligence. Certainly New View is not going to do it for you. Um, but giving yourself that ability to really touch the real estate market across lots of spectrums uh, is is good diversity and diversity, as we all know, is is positive. So let's maybe kind of wrap wrap this up with the market. Um, you know, we're in early 2024. Uh, you know, we we we've said in in our season one of the show. You know, and with different people, it's always interesting. Like, what inning of this game are we in? Right? Are we at the end of the game? Is is that game ended, and we're kind of starting a new game? So, you know, Jason, give us a little bit of insight. And I know you cover a lot of different markets, so maybe the answer is a little bit more general for you than uh, than it would be. Uh, you know, if you're only in one space. But what are you seeing? What do you think about this interest rates, um, you know, flatlining and, and lots of, of rumors and speculation that we're going to see a decline? What are you seeing and, and you know, what's your outlook for 2024? Man, I wish I had a crystal ball. So I knew exactly um, there. There are a lot of indicators. So let me just hit some of those indicators for you. And, and then I'll let the, the listener, you know, make that decision uh, based off of based off that. Um, here's a couple indicators. Indicator number one, there's not enough inventory. There's just not, uh, especially for the migration of the millennial generation, like I mentioned earlier in the show. Um, we're seeing just a lot of people uh, moving out of their parents' basement or out of the apartment that they've been rooming with four other people. Um, COVID had a lot to do with that and, and accelerating that that process after being in quarantine for a certain amount of time. People uh, want a bigger space. 
um, a lot of the millennial generation are finally now getting married and, and wanting to start, you know, families and, and buy their first home. The problem is we just don't have enough inventory. There's a major, major deficit because of 2009, 2010, new construction came to a complete halt. And then it kind of increased a little bit in the in that deficit because of uh, COVID. Uh, people didn't know what was going to happen. They were afraid of uh, to a repeat of 2009, 2010. Um, you had supply chains that, that were really affected. And so we have this deficit. And even if we sped up, I think, three times the amount of new construction that we did every, every year, it would still take four or five years to even get caught up. So that, that's number one. Number two, the only thing that's really kind of slowing down the real estate market right now is that interest rate hike. Um, people still bought. However, they weren't um, there weren't multiple offers. They weren't, you know, offers way over asking. Uh, people were being a lot more choosy. And and so you you saw, um, I guess, things sit just a little bit, but yet the inventory was still low because of another reason. Uh, seven out of 10 uh, homeowners, their mortgages were less than 3% interest. So even if they wanted to sell, they aren't going to sell to replace that mortgage with a six plus seven plus interest rate. So there's this real like strain on the market and to the chagrin of a lot of experts, it's kind of stayed stable. Yeah. We've seen prices come down maybe just a little bit. Uh, we've seen maybe property stay on the market a little bit longer. We've seen maybe uh, buyers maybe struggle with lending qualifications in the ninth hour and uh, in the ninth inning and right before closing, the deal falls through. So there has been a little bit of chaos. But with interest rates maybe potentially coming down, you're going to see the real estate market shoot way up again. And so I, I do feel very confident with that. The other, the other thing that I am saying is that people can't buy, they got to live somewhere. So that's why the rental space is a great place to park your capital right now because you're going to get good cash flow. And over time, you're going to see uh your uh properties appreciate because again the market will boom at some point again and and that's real estate and really that's investing in general you're going to have the ebbs and flows but when you invest with the mindset of decades versus months in real estate you're always going to win because it always goes up and i think um we've gotten really greedy as investors over the last six seven years because we've We've really gotten spoiled with great economies and great markets and houses literally dub doubling in value in six months to a year. And so we just think, oh, okay, that's the way it's going to be from now on. And in reality, that was kind of a unicorn. So if we invest with decades in mind, you're going to win and you're going to win big. And you're going to be able to help your kids and your grandkids win big with that mindset as well. Well, you, you nailed it, you know, and that is just being long in, in investments is the strategy, right? Um, and when, when you're long and there's a, it, it pays you to, to liquidate early, great. Um, but, um, you know, whether it's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, there's so much truth to that. And uh, as a, you know, I don't do a lot of stock investing and, you know, I bought some, some assets and I sold them right, right in the downside of COVID, right? Because I didn't think with a, a long investor mindset, right? The market spooked me. They were liquid. I could sell them immediately. And, you know, three assets that I certainly wish I owned today because uh, they've all since doubled or, or more uh, since that point. And so, you know, if I look at some of the real estate stuff, it's not as liquid. You, you've got to hold it longer and you're a little bit forced participation to not think about small movements in the market. And so a 20 percent drop on an asset that's still generating rental revenue doesn't really feel like an issue. Um, because you're already making rent and you didn't buy it, you know, with a, a point to sell it. You bought it with the idea that over time you were going to make money. So I appreciate you kind of sharing that. I think so many investors overlook it. And, you know, recency syndrome and FOMO cause these, you know, sort of really, uh, you know, they're, they're not logical, but it happens to all of us, right? We think that, well, if I buy this property, I can sell it for twice as much in a year because that's how it, it worked in 2020 and 21. Why doesn't it work that way in 23 and 24? And same thing in the stock market, right? So, you know, best advice I ever got is be elated if you average 10% return. Yeah. Be elated um, because that's that's going to outperform over the long haul, really anything. Um, so, well, I I love um, I love your story, Jason. I, I love how you kind of entered into real estate, how you're chasing this entrepreneurial dream. And, and then I love how you're helping other investors um, access the real estate market. And you're not just doing it by saying, 
give me your money and you're doing it by saying, hey, look at your strategy, line up your investment philosophy. And if you want to be a lender, be a lender. If you want to own property, own property. And if you want to invest in a fund, invest in a fund. Any and all of those are, are welcome. So thank you, Jason. Uh, we're going to wrap things up today. And, and uh, you know, we, we're changing things up a bit in season two. Season one, we always wrapped up our show with the learn before you burn right? Help us understand a good lesson and experience so that we can get just the lesson without the experience. Um, but we're going to wrap up season two uh, podcast episodes with uh, with this, which is, Jason, what is keeping you up at night? Hmm. Um, man, great question. A lot of things keep me up at night. Sometimes it's that pepperoni pizza at 11 uh, p.m. But uh, no, I, I think what keeps me up and what, what I struggle with sometimes is is knowing the responsibility to whom much is given much is required and and sometimes and that that could be in, in anything you know i want to be a good leader i want to be a good uh like i want to produce for my investors um and just being very transparent um in, in tough markets you really have to work hard to produce and sometimes um, that production is not always going to be as good as maybe what it was in a good market. You know, you've got maybe houses that are still sitting on the market waiting for uh, deals or, you know, it, it, so it, I think sometimes you, you are concerned about just doing the best for other people. And, and, and so that's, that's just a challenge because there's just a, a huge responsibility. You know, you got employees that you're responsible for, uh, you got investors you're responsible for. Um, but yet at the same time, you gotta be responsible for your own self and your health. A lot of entrepreneurs put other people first and, and rightfully so in a lot of ways. Uh, but sometimes you can cause harm by doing that to your mental health and, and, uh, and your relationships and, and so forth. Um, so my advice on how to handle that, and it's something that I'm, that I'm working on myself. So don't, don't make it, I don't want to make it seem like I uh, have the answer. I've solved this, but trust God as simple as that sounds. That's probably the most difficult thing to do is just really trust God and, and, you know, pray for that daily bread. That there, that's the reason why that's in the Lord's prayer. It's a daily thing. And it's a daily need. So every day, Lord, provide me my daily bread. That may look a little different for each individual. Maybe it's, Lord, help me get some houses under contract. Lord, help this inspection to go through. Lord, help this lender to come through. You know, what, whatever the case may be, that that's the key. And, and there's promises in the word that in seasons of drought, the people that flourish are the people that trust in the Lord. So that's something that I'm really working on because we are kind of in an uncertainty type market and you could be optimistic all you want. You could do great work all you want. You could do everything right and something still go wrong that you just can't control. And yeah, that can keep you up at night. But when you, when you trust that God is going to take care of you and you just do the best that you can, it helps. So Anyways, that's just a little opening the curtain to my heart, I guess. And hopefully that helps you or helps the listener it's, you know, with something that they're going through. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think no matter what's keeping you up at night, certainly letting go of that vine and, and putting it in God's hands is always a good start. Um, but, you know, it, and I appreciate you saying you haven't solved it yet. And, and that is what keeps you up at night. And I think no matter what you do, um, you know, and, and what entrepreneurial line of work you get into but if it's something like real estate and you're dealing with other people's money um it is the life of an entrepreneur and there's probably uh you know a million answers you could have shared uh on the what's keeping you up but i think everybody kind of struggles with that and and i think your advice is is spot on and, and prudent jason thank you thank you for being here Absolutely. good uh, good luck to you and your your uh, investment career good luck to uh, to your wife tori and her country music career looking forward to hearing her on the radio and and seeing you continue to do great and, and bigger things than you're already doing now so um appreciate you being here hey thank you so much for the opportunity i really appreciate it jason and we'll throw Jason's contact info into the show notes. If you want to reach out to Jason directly, uh, you can certainly do that and, and uh, get any questions uh, that you have for him asked and answered. Um, thank you guys for, for another great episode. Uh, we appreciate you being loyal listeners to the All About Alts podcast. 
Uh, we ask that you click the like, share, and subscribe button. Leave us a five-star review uh, if you haven't done that so others can get a feel for uh, what you're getting out of the show. If you have topic ideas or quirky questions, make sure you send those over to allaboutalts at newviewtrust.com. And we'll certainly get those read and, and onto the show where it makes sense. So thanks again, everybody, and take care. Thank you so much for listening. We hope the information within this podcast has given you the tools that you need to find your way to financial independence. We would love to partner with you on this journey. Text ALTS, that's A-L-T-S, to 407 708 1853 to learn more about how to get started today. Don't forget to follow us to make sure you don't miss a second of content and we'll see you next week.